Oh, splendid. You've returned. Welcome to Madison Public Library in Madison, Ohio's Theater of the Mind, Halloween edition. Tonight, we have the second part of William Wilson by Edgar Allan Poe. To hear more stories, like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Last night, we left off with a narrator talking about how he picked on William Wilson. And we return to William Wilson by Edgar Allan Poe. Wilson's retaliation in kind were many, and there was one form of his practical wit that disturbed me beyond measure. How his sagacity first discovered at all that so petty a thing would vex me is a question I could never solve, but, having discovered, he habitually practiced the annoyance. I had always felt aversion to my uncourtly patronymic and its very uncommon, if not plebeian, prenomen. The words were venom in my ears, and when, upon the day of my arrival, a second William Wilson came also to the academy, I felt angry with him for bearing the name, and doubly disgusted with the name, because a stranger bore it, who would be the cause of its twofold repetition, who would be constantly in my presence, and whose concerns, in the ordinary routine of the school business, must inevitably, on account of the detestable coincidence, be often confounded with my own. The feeling of vexation thus engendered grew stronger with every circumstance tending to show resemblance, moral or physical, between my rival and myself. I had not then discovered the remarkable fact that we are of the same age, but I saw that we were of the same height, and I perceived that we were even singularly alike in general contour of person and outline of feature. I was galled, too, by the rumor touching a relationship which had grown current in the upper forms. In a word, nothing could more seriously disturb me, although I scrupulously concealed such disturbance, than any allusion to a similarity of mind, person, or condition existing between us. But, in truth, I had no reason to believe that with the exception of the matter of relationship, and in the case of Wilson himself, the similarity had ever been made a subject of comments, or even observed at all by our school fellows, that he observed it in all its bearings, and as fixedly as I was apparent, but that he could discover in such circumstances so fruitful a field of annoyance can only be attributed, as I said before, to his more than ordinary penetration. His cue which was to perfect an imitation of myself, lay both in words and in actions. And most admirably did he play his part. My dress, it was an easy matter to copy. My gait and general manner were, without difficulty, appropriated. In spite of his constitutional defect, even my voice did not escape him. My louder tones were, of course, unattempted. But then the key, it was identical. And a singular whisper, it grew the very echo of my own. How greatly this most exquisite portraiture harassed me, for it could not justly be termed a caricature. I will now venture to describe. I had but one consolation, in the fact that the imitation, apparently, was noticed by myself alone, and that I had to endure only the knowing and strangely sarcastic smiles of my namesake himself. Satisfied with having produced in my bosom the intended effect, he seemed to chuckle in secret over the sting he had inflicted, and was characteristically disregardful of the public applause which the success of his witty endeavors might have so easily elicited. That the school, indeed, did not feel his design, perceive its accomplishment, and participate in his sneer was, for many anxious months, a riddle I could not resolve. Perhaps the gradation of his copy rendered it not so readily perceptible, or, more possibly, I owed my security to the master heir of the copyist, who, disdaining the letter, which in a painting is all the obtuse can see, gave but the full spirit of his original for my individual contemplation and chagrin. I have already more than once spoken of the disgusting air of patronage which he assumed toward me, and of his frequent officious interference with me my will. 
this interference often took the ungracious character of advice, advice not openly given, but hinted or insinuated. I received it with a repugnance which gained strength as I grew in years. Yet, at this distant day, let me do him the simple justice to acknowledge that I can recall no occasion when the suggestions of my rival were on the side of those errors or follies so usual to his immature age and seeming inexperience. That his moral sense, at least, if not his general talents and worldly wisdom, was far keener than my own. And that I might, today, have been a better and thus happier man, had I less frequently rejected the counsels embodied in those meaning whispers which I then but too cordially hated and too bitterly despised. As it was, I at length grew restive in the extreme under his distasteful supervision, and daily resented more and more openly what I considered his intolerable arrogance. I have said that... In the first years of our connection as schoolmates, my feelings in regard to him might have been easily ripened into friendship. But, in the latter months of my residence at the academy, although the intrusion of his ordinary manner had, beyond doubt, in some measure abated, my sentiments, in nearly similar proportion, partook very much a positive hatred. Upon one occasion he saw this, I think, and afterwards avoided, or made a show of avoiding me. It was about the same period, if I remember all right, that in an altercation of violence with him, in which he was more than usually thrown off his guard, and spoke and acted with an openness of demeanor rather foreign to his nature, I discovered, or fancied I discovered, in his accents, his air, and general appearance, a something which first startled, and then deeply interested me, by bringing to mind dim vision of my earliest infancy wild, confused, and thronging memories of a time when memory herself was yet unborn. I cannot better describe the sensation which oppressed me than by saying that I could with difficulty shake off the belief of having been acquainted with the being who stood before me at some epoch very long ago, some point of the past even infinitely remote. The delusion, however, faded rapidly as it came and I mention it all but to define the day of the last conversation I there held with my singular namesake. The huge old house, with its countless subdivisions, had several large chambers communicating with each other, where slept the greater number of the students. There were, however, as must necessarily happen in a building so awkwardly planned, many little nooks and recesses, the odds and ends of the structure, and these the economic ingenuity of Dr. Bransby had also fitted up as dormitories. Although, being the merest closets, they were capable of accommodating but a single individual. One of these small apartments was occupied by Wilson. One night, about the close of my fifth year at the school, and immediately after the altercation just mentioned, finding everyone wrapped in sleep, I arose from bed and, lamp in hand, stole through a wilderness of narrow passages from my own bedroom to that of my rival. I had long been plotting one of those ill-natured pieces of practical wit at his expense in which I had hitherto been so uniformly unsuccessful. It was my intention now to put my scheme in operation, and I resolved to make him feel the whole extent of the malice with which I was imbued. Having reached his closet, I noiselessly entered leaving the lamp with a shade over it on the outside. I advanced a step, and listened to the sound of his tranquil breathing. Assured of his being asleep, I returned, took the light, and with it again approached the bed. Close curtains were around it, which, in the prosecution of my plan, I slowly and quietly withdrew, when the bright rays fell vividly upon the sleeper, and my eyes at the same moment upon his countenance. I looked, and a numbness, an iciness of feeling instantly pervaded my frame. My breast heaved, my knees tottered, my whole spirit became possessed with an objectless yet intolerable horror. Were these, these the lineaments of William Wilson? I saw, indeed, that they were his, but I shook as if with a fit of the ague in fancying they were not. What was there about them to confound me in this manner? I gazed, 
while my brain reeled with a multitude of incoherent thoughts. Not thus he appeared, assuredly, not thus, in the vivacity of his waking hours. The same name, the same contour of person, the same day of arrival at the academy, and then this dogged and meaningless imitation of my gait, my voice, my habit, and my manner. Was it, in truth, within the bounds of human possibility, that what I now saw was the result, merely, of the habitual practice of this sarcastic imitation? Awe-stricken, and with a creeping shudder, I extinguished the lamp, passed silently from the chamber, and left, at once, the halls of that old academy, never to enter them again. After a lapse of some months, spent at home in mere idleness, I found myself a student at Eton. The brief interval had been sufficient to enfeeble my remembrance of the events at Dr. Bransby's, or at least to effect a material change in the nature of the feelings with which I remembered them. The truth, the tragedy, of the drama was no more. I could now find room to doubt the evidence of my senses, and seldom called up the subject at all but with wonder at the extent of human credulity and a smile at the vivid force of imagination which I hereditarily possessed. Neither was this species of skepticism likely to be diminished by the character of life I led at Eton. The vortex of thoughtless folly into which I there so immediately and so recklessly plunged washed away all but the froth of my past hours, engulfed at once every solid or serious impression, and left to memory only the various levities of a former existence. I do not wish, however, to trace the course of my miserable profligacy here a profligacy which set at defiance the laws, which had eluded the vigilance of the institution. Three years of folly, passed without profit, had but given me rooted habits of vice, and added, in a somewhat unusual degree, to my bodily stature, when, after a week of soulless dissipation, I invited a small party of the most dissolute students to the sacred carousal in my chamber. We met at a late hour of the night, for our debaucheries were to be faithfully protracted until morning. The wine flowed freely, and there were not wanting other and perhaps more dangerous seductions so that the gray dawn had already faintly appeared in the east, while our delirious extravagance was at its height. Madly flushed with cards and intoxication, I was in the act of insisting upon a toast of more than wanted profanity, when my attention was suddenly diverted by the violent, although partial enclosing of the door of the apartment, and by the eager voice of a servant from without. He said that some person apparently in great haste, demanded to speak with me in the hall. Wildly excited with wine, the unexpected interruption rather delighted than surprised me. I staggered forward at once, and a few steps brought me to the vestibule of the building. In this low and small room there hung no lamp, and now no light at all was admitted, save that of the exceedingly feeble dawn which made its way through the semicircular window. As I put my foot over the threshold, I became aware of the figure of youth about my own height, and habited in a white cursy mere morning frock, cut in the novel fashion of the one I myself wore at the moment. This the faint light enabled me to perceive, but the features of his face I could not distinguish. Upon my entering he strode hurriedly up to me, and seizing me by the arm with a gesture of petulant impatience, whispered the words, William! Wilson, in my ear. I grew perfectly sober in an instant. There was that in the manner of the stranger, and in the tremulous shake of his uplifted finger as he held it between my eyes and the light, which filled me with unqualified amazement. But it was not this which had so violently moved me. It was the pregnancy of solemn admonition in the singular, low, hissing utterance. And above all, it was the character, the tone, the key of those few simple and familiar yet whispered syllables, which came with a thousand thronging memories of bygone days, and struck upon my soul with the shock of a galvanic battery. Ere I could recover the use of my senses, he was gone. 
Although this event failed not of a vivid effect upon my disordered imagination, yet it was evanescent as vivid. For some weeks, indeed, I busied myself in earnest inquiry, or wrapped in a cloud of morbid speculation. I did not pretend to disguise from my perception the identity of the singular individual who thus preservingly interfered with my affairs, and harassed me with his insinuated counsel. But who and what was this Wilson? And whence came he? And what were his purposes? Upon neither of these points could I be satisfied, merely ascertaining in regarding him that a certain accident in his family had caused his removal from Dr. Bransby's academy on the afternoon of the day in which I myself had eloped. But in a brief period I ceased to think upon the subject, my attention being all absorbed in a contemplated departure for Oxford. Thither I soon went. The uncalculating vanity of my parents furnishing me with an outfit and annual establishment, which would enable me to indulge at will in the luxury already so dear to my heart, to vie in profuseness of expenditure with the haughtiest heirs of the wealthiest heirdoms in Great Britain. Excited by such appliances to vice, my constitutional temperament broke forth with redoubled ardor, and I spurned even the common restraints of decency in the mad infatuation of my revels. But it were absurd to pause in the detail of my extravagance. Let it suffice that among spendthrift I outherited Herod, and that, given name to multitude of novel follies, I added no brief appendix to the long catalogue of vices than usual in the most dissolute university of Europe. It could hardly be credited, however, that I had, even here, so utterly fallen from the gentlemanly estate as to seek acquaintance with the vilest arts of the gambler by profession, and having become an adept in his despicable science, to practice it habitually as a mean of increasing my already enormous income at the expense of the weak-minded among my fellow collegians. Such, nevertheless, was the fact and the very enormity of this offence against all manly and honourable sentiment proved beyond doubt the main if not the sole reason of the impunity with which it was committed who indeed among my most abandoned associates would not rather have disputed the clearest evidence of his senses than have suspected of such courses the gay the frank the generous william wilson the noblest and most commoner at oxford him whose follies said his parasites were but the follies of youth and unbridled fancy whose errors but intimidable whim whose darkest vice but a careless and dashing extravagance i had been now two years successfully busied in this way when there came to the university a young parvenu nobleman glendinning rich said report as herodus atticus his riches too as easily acquired. I soon found him of weak intellect, and of course marked him as a fitting subject for my skill. I frequently engaged him in play, and contrived, with the gambler's usual art, to let him win considerable sums, than more effectually to entangle him in my snares. At length, my schemes being ripe, I met him, with the full intention that this meeting should be final and decisive, at the chambers of a fellow commoner, Mr. Preston, equally intimate with both, but who, to do him justice, entertained not even a remote suspicion of my design. To give this a better colouring, I had contrived to have assembled a party of some eight or ten, and was so solicitously careful that the introduction of cards should appear accidental, and originate in the proposal of my contemplated dupe himself. To be brief upon a vile topic, none of the low finesse was omitted, so customary upon similar occasions that it is just a matter for wonder how any are still found so besotted as to fall its victim. We had protracted our sitting far into the night, and I had at length effected the maneuver of getting Glendinning as my sole antagonist. The game, too, was my favorite at heart. The rest of the company, interested in the extent of our play, had abandoned their own cards, and were standing around us as spectators. The parvenu, who had been induced by my artifices in the early part of the evening, to drink deeply, now shuffled, dealt, or played, with a wild nervousness of manner for which his intoxication, I thought, might partially, but could not altogether account. 
In a short period he had become my debtor to a large amount when, having taken a long drought of port, he did precisely what I had been coolly anticipating. He proposed to double our, our already extravagant stakes. With a well-feigned show of reluctance, and not until after my repeated refusal had seduced him into some angry words which gave a color of pique to my compliance, did I finally comply. The result, of course, did prove how entirely the prey was in my toils. In less than an hour he had quadrupled his debts. For some time his countenance had been losing the florid tinge lent it by the wine. But now, to my astonishment, I perceived that it had grown to a pallor truly fearful. I say to my astonishment. Glendinning had been represented to my eager inquiries as immeasurably wealthy, and the sums which he had as yet lost, although in themselves vast, could not, I supposed, very seriously annoy, much less so violently affect him. That he was overcome by the wine just swallowed, was the idea which most readily presented itself, and, rather with a view to the preservation of my own character in the eyes of my associates, than from any less interested motive, I was about to insist, preemptorily, upon a discontinuance of the play, when some expressions at my elbow from among the company, and an ejaculation evincing utter despair on the part of Glendinning, gave me to understand that I had effected his total ruin under circumstances which, rendering him an object for the pity of all, should have protected him from the ill offices even of a fiend. What now might have been my conduct, it is difficult to say. The pitiable condition of my dupe had thrown an air of embarrassed gloom over all, and, for some moments, a profound silence was maintained during which i could not help feeling my cheeks tingle with the many burning glances of scorn or reproach cast upon me by the less abandoned of the party i will even own that an intolerable weight of anxiety was for a brief instant lifted from my bosom by the sudden and extraordinary interruption which ensued the wide heavy folding doors of the apartment were all at once thrown open to their full extent with a vigorous and rushing impetuosity that extinguished as if by magic every candle in the room their light in dying enabled us to perceive that a stranger had entered about my own height and closely muffled in a cloak the darkness however was now total and we could only feel that he was standing in our midst before any of us could recover from the extreme astonishment into which this rudeness had thrown all we heard the voice of the intruder and this was the second part of william wilson by edgar allan poe don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our youtube channel for the final part of this story also follow us on facebook twitter instagram and pinterest have a great night